Welcome to session 3C, Effects of Homophobia on Parents of LGBTs. This session is aimed at parents of LGBT young people and professionals who are in a position to support them. I'm thinking of child and adolescent mental health workers, social workers, school nurses or youth workers. It can also be useful when working with young LGBTs to help them understand what their parents are going through. My experience of working with young LGBTs over many years has taught me that when parents first find out about their children, their responses can range from positive, such as finding out how to support their child, challenging homophobia, transphobia, and maybe joining family and friends of lesbians and gays, to total rejection, throwing the child out and never speaking to them again. But the vast majority are somewhere in between. They can be initially shocked, although some might suspect. Perhaps create a scene and tell their children not to tell anyone else, especially their grandparents, because it's likely to kill them. However, parents gradually come round to some level of acceptance, but they, ra they rarely speak about it again. This is hardly surprising because parents, like young LGBTs, have internalised the negative messages about homosexuality and trans issues. And unless they've met someone who's challenged these beliefs, they too will be homophobic or transphobic and will experience a similar conflict which young people go through when they first realise they're LGBT. Understanding this can help both the young person and their parents. Because they don't know any better and because they want to safeguard their child and themselves from becoming an outsider, some parents purposefully put down homosexuals and homosexuality in the hope that this will somehow stop their child being LGBT. Others go to great lengths to try and change the sexual orientation of their child, which of course is not possible. While still others refuse to allow their child to attend an LGBT youth support group, that is, if they're lucky enough to have one locally. Because, like their children, they too have internalised negative messages about homosexuality or trans people, just like their child, parents often go through a similar developmental process of acceptance. Understanding this can be helpful to all concerned. For those parents who have already challenged their internalised homophobia, transphobia, the process will be very different. They are more likely to respond positively and support their child and seek support for themselves. However, as evidence shows, many parents are stuck with internal beliefs that homosexuality is a perversion against nature or their religion and simply cannot accept that the child is gay. Stage two, parents become aware that the child's different from the majority and may respond with denial, i.e. ignoring it and hoping it will go away, identifying with the aggressor, threatening the child or putting pressure on the child to conform, rationalisation, it's a phase, they'll grow out of it. They're also likely to be concerned about what others might think. I'd like to share with you some of the things young people believe or know what their fathers think about homosexuality. It's wrong. I'm his daughter. He doesn't want to think of me in that way. He doesn't take any interest. He's unhappy about it. He probably finds me a disappointment. He'll disown me. He doesn't like it overt, but he doesn't make an issue of it. He pretends it doesn't happen. He'll take it badly. I don't think he'd like it. He's my stepdad. Because I'm gay, he says he wishes that I was never born. And here are some things that young people believe or know what their mothers think about homosexuality. She doesn't like me being gay, but I'm a daughter. She doesn't like me talking about anything to do with being gay. 
She'd rather I wasn't, but she doesn't force me to change like she tried to at first. She doesn't even want to think about it. She's homophobic. She's unhappy about it. She's gender homophobic. If you're born that way, it's mine and your dad's fault. Ignore it and hope it'll go away. She thinks it's a phase and I'll grow out of it. She won't like it. She doesn't really accept it. She's okay with it, but she doesn't want others to know. She's okay with everybody else being gay, except me. At times she's supportive, but sometimes she's got reservations. She'd like me to meet a girl so that she'll have grandchildren. Stage three. In this stage, there's some level of acceptance. There are concerns about what their child might face, but at the same time, there can be tolerance of discrimination. They don't want to talk about it. Some parents get stuck in either the second or third stages. However, they might meet positive role models who challenge stereotypes. They might have access to accurate information and meet other parents who accept their children. If this happens, parents can move on to stage four. They begin to challenge their internalised negative messages. They find out more about what their child is likely to experience and how they can support them. In the final stage, parents develop confidence to deal with any challenges they may face about their child's orientation. Some get involved in challenging homophobia and transphobia. Here are some of the reasons why parents can get stuck in stages two or three. Use of alcohol or drugs to cope. Remaining isolated without access to accurate information, support or peer support, positive role models. Fundamental religion. If this is the issue, then session 3b could help with it. Multipression. It's less likely that parents who are multipressed will be able to access information, support and positive role models. Negative responses from others who find out their child is LGB or T. And possibly having issues with their own sexuality that they haven't dealt with. In the first big survey of its kind, Youth Chances published the first reference report in January 2014 of a survey they conduct with LGBT young people aged between 16 and 25 years old across England. Of the 5,437 young LGBTs, 71% were out to the mothers, whilst 55% were out to the fathers. The participants could answer on a scale 1 to 10 as to how their parents responded, one being poor and 10 being good. I've half the responses to come up with the following. Mothers. 33% responded poor to middling, 67% middling to good. Fathers, again, 33% poor to middling, and again, 67% middling to good. Before I set up Gay and Lesbian Youth in Calderdale in 1999, I conducted research with 15 young people aged 30 years and below who either lived or grew up in Calderdale. I later adapted the original questionnaire to develop a screening device which I call the Needs Assessment Tool, or NAT for short. During the period 2005 to 2008, 50 NATs were conducted with young people who accessed Gaelic. Of these, 76% were out to the mums, of whom 53% responded poorly, whilst 62% were out to the fathers, with 38% responding badly. Between 2008 and 2010, a further 20 NATs were completed. 80% were out to the mother, of whom 44% responded poorly, whilst 55% were out to the fathers, with 45% responding poorly. For the period 2010 to 11, another 10 NATs were conducted. 
90% were out to the mothers with 66% poor response, whilst 70% were out to the fathers with a 29% poor response. There's several points worth noting. Firstly, consistently, the young people in Calderdale were more likely to be out to the parents. This isn't surprising given that most people, given that most of them were attending Gaelic and young people who attend LGBT youth groups are more likely to be out to the parents. Secondly, these findings are within the context of young LGBT people coming out at younger ages. And thirdly, it's clear that a significant proportion of young LGBTs experience a poor response from the parents when they first come out. I'm now going to show you two short videos of me reading out true stories. The first one is about Paul and the second one about Paula. This is Paul's story. Paul first contacted the gay youth group when he was 15. He was living at home with his parents at the time and was at school. His family are Catholic. Paul came to the gay youth group a few times and went out with another member. He got home late one night and during a row with his mum, he told her he was gay and that he was in a relationship. The row got worse. His mum screamed, hit him and threw him out of the house. This happened when Paul was in the middle of his exams. Paul contacted the youth worker in a state. The youth worker contacted the duty social worker who advised contacting the police. Meanwhile, they would arrange emergency accommodation. The youth worker arrived at Paul's parents' house at about 11 o'clock at night. The police were already there. They'd been inside the house to talk to his parents, who were complaining about Paul having a relationship with an 18-year-old gay man. The police told Paul's parents that it was illegal for an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old to have sex. The age of consent for gay men had been equalised a few years earlier, but obviously the police were not aware of this. Paul was outside when the police arrived and had some of his belongings in a black plastic bag. The youth worker took him to the homeless hostel where he stayed the night. In conversation with Paul, the youth worker discovered his aunt was supportive. So she was contacted and asked to speak to Paul's parents. As a result of this, Paul returned home the next day. It took several weeks, but eventually things settled down at home. Although there is now some level of acceptance from his parents, nevertheless, Paul is not allowed to attend the gay youth group. He remains isolated and vulnerable to making dangerous liaisons with older gay men via the internet. After one such liaison, he ended up in hospital, having attempted suicide. This is Paula's story. She wrote it when she was 16. My name is Paula. I'm 16 and my partner Jane is 17 going on 18. We've been together one and a half years. We've kept our relationship quiet because I was 14 when we got together. But since then, things have become more serious and we wanted to tell the family. Jane's grandma fosters me and this is how we met. So it makes things a lot harder for us. I told my mum when we'd been together nearly a year. She was shocked, but has learnt to accept it and is okay with us now, and she's standing by us. Jane's family started to realise that we weren't just best friends, but they kept saying things like, it's not natural for two girls to be like this. All you care about is yourselves. It's not natural. You should be mixing with other people, not just each other all the time. We tried to ignore their comments because we knew they would want to split us up if we told them. 
So the plan was that we'd tell them when I was 16 and had done all my GCSEs, and then we could move out together. However, Jane was becoming depressed and decided to go and see the doctor. She told the doctor she was gay. The doctor referred her to the local gay youth group. We met the youth worker and started to go to the youth group where there are other people like us. We enjoy this group because we can be ourselves and be free. Jane and her mum were having an argument Usually when this happened, her mother makes snide remarks about Jane and me. Jane snapped and told her that she was gay and that we were having a relationship. Her mother reacted very badly. She said things like, you're confused. You're just very good close friends. I'll end up in the mental hospital if you're gay. I'll kill myself. She would not accept what we were saying. Then my foster carer, Janet, asked me if it was true and I said it was. Janet tried to tell me I wasn't lesbian. She said things like, it's just your hormones. You got too close to each other. I said it was true. She insisted it was just a phase we were both going through. I said it wasn't. She said, well, we'll see. To which I replied, Yes, we will see. Things got even worse. We started to get bad verbal abuse. For example, Janet said to me, you are killing my daughter. My daughter, Jane's mum, is down there ill. You're killing her. They've tried to turn us both against each other by lying about things when we're apart. They tried to stop us from seeing each other by keeping us in, saying things like, over our dead bodies will you move in together. We've got the power to stop you from seeing each other. <clears throat> they discussed and talked about moving us away from each other for a few months. So we ran away and stayed at a friend's. We wanted to move out, but couldn't for financial reasons. Jane's leaving her job. She needs another job so that we can rely on her money. I'm still at school, so I can't get a job till I leave school. While we were away, both Janet and Jane's mother contacted the police. When we got back home after three days, the police were waiting. They gave us a caution and told us off for wasting police time. Jane told the police officers, a man and a woman, what had happened. The policeman seemed to listen. But the policewoman said that we were just a couple of teenagers wanting to play house. She said they had better things to do than to waste it trying to find two silly girls. We thought we'd sorted things out with Jane's mum and Janet. We all agreed that Jane and me could see each other after school or work every day, but we weren't allowed to sleep at each other's house. Jane and me have stuck to this, but now Jane's mum has started to drink and things have got bad again. Jane's mum's friend saw us cuddling on the street near home and told her. So when Jane got home, her mother started shouting at her, saying things like, All the family are ashamed of you. We don't want people seeing that. You are a disgrace to the lesbian community. They don't do that in public. Janet shouted at me and said, you should be doing that in private, not in public, on the street. I said, well, we can't. You won't let us be in a room together on our own. All we were doing was holding hands and cuddling. Things got worse as Jane's mum started to give physical abuse. On the advice of the youth worker, I told my social worker what was happening. She met with Jane and me. Later, Jane and me went home and had a chat with Janet and Jane's mum. At first, they blamed me, and I got most of the verbal abuse. But after my social worker had spoken to Janet, she calmed down. Now Jane's getting most of the verbal abuse. 
but her mother's begun hitting her. Jane and me are desperately wanting to get away from there. Jane's having interviews to get another job. We've been to housing and we're trying to get a temporary placement just until Jane gets a job where we can get our own place. Then when I leave school, I'm going to get a job so I will have some money to support us both as well as Jane's money. All Jane's family are against us and trying to tell us that it's just a phase. My mum has told my family and they were shocked that they're going to stand by us. So we hope to be living together and away from the family and hopefully they will come to terms with it soon. The NSPCC define emotional abuse as, quote, when a parent or carer behaves in a way that is likely to seriously affect their child's emotional development. It can range from constant rejection and denial of affection through to continual severe criticism, deliberate humiliation and other ways of verbally terrorising a child, unquote. The NSPCC add, quote, all children need acceptance, love, encouragement, discipline, consistency and positive attention from their parents. Children who are denied these things often grow up thinking they are deficient in some way and that they somehow deserve to be treated badly. I wanted to find out more about the emotional abuse Gallic members experienced whilst growing up and whether this was in any way connected to their sexual or gender identity. In 2010, I adapted the NAT to include further questions, asking members what happened to them when they were growing up. Here are the responses from the last 30 NATs. 17% said their movements were restricted. 27% experienced patterns of belittling, denigrating, name-calling. 23% were scapegoated. 20% received threats. 37% were intimidated. 37% were frightened. 13% experienced discrimination. 23% were ridiculed. 27% experienced constant criticism, 20% were rejected, and 23% had love, support or guidance withheld. In total then, 40-40% of the 30 young people said they had experienced emotional abuse whilst growing up. 58% came from their mothers, 42% from their fathers, and 42% from their siblings. Of these, 75% said the abuse was related to their sexual orientation. Only 17% reported the abuse and they said it was dealt with successfully. When I studied the findings of the NAPS, there appears to be a difference between those young people who self-harm and those who self-harm and attempt suicide. Those with rejecting parents were more likely to attempt suicide. My suggestion is confirmed by Caitlin Ryan et al. in their paper Family Rejection and Health Risks, published in 2009. The research was conducted with 224 white and Latino self-identified LGB young people aged 21 to 25. They found that LGB youth who reported high levels of family rejection during adolescence were 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide, 5.9 times more likely to report high levels of depression, 3.4 times more likely to use illegal drugs, and 3.4 times more likely to have engaged in unprotected sexual intercourse than those with accepting parents. Further research by Caitlin Ryan and her colleagues at the Family Acceptance Project 
included 245 young LGBTs. The findings were published in an article called Family Acceptance and Wellbeing in 2010. Ryan found that family acceptance predicts greater self-esteem, social support and general health status. It also protects against depression, substance abuse and suicide ideation and behaviours. She concluded that family acceptance of LGBT adolescents is associated with positive young adult mental and physical health and that interventions which promote parental and caregiving acceptance of LGBT adolescents are needed to reduce health disparities. There is nothing like the Family Acceptance Project in the UK. FAP have developed training materials, films and evidence to work with families of LGBT young people. They have discovered that if parents change even a little bit, this helps to reduce the negative effects of homophobia on their children. The Family Acceptance Project have produced some excellent materials to help parents and those who work with parents. The Practitioner's Resource Guide Helping Families to Support Their LGBT Children was prepared by Caitlin Ryan and published by the American Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. It says that parents and carers who try to change their child's sexual orientation or gender expression are often, or often motivated by concern that the children won't fit in. Negative outcomes for LGBT youth such as homelessness, suicide, and placement in foster care can be prevented or reduced if parents carers are given knowledge gu knowledgeable guidance, accurate information and support. Many parents and families whose relationships have broken down want to reconnect with their children. I'd like to conclude this section by recommending you acquire further information. If you go to the Gallic website and click on support and then parents, you'll be able to access links to lots of helpful resources, including the Family Acceptance Project. I would recommend you look at the two short videos, which are introductions to the Family Acceptance Project's films called Families Are Forever and Always My Son, which follows on. In session 4b, I recommend you view an extract from the film For the Bible Tells Me So. It's about a mother, Mary Lou Walner, who talks about how she rejected her daughter, Anna Louise, who then went on to kill herself. Perhaps it's more important to view this extract now. I want to emphasise that none of us are born with homophobic and transphobic views. It's the influence of religion, medicine, law, the media, education and our own families and friends that make us homophobic and transphobic. What has been done can be undone. If you are a parent with an LGBT child, your actions can and do make a huge difference. I'd also recommend you look at some extracts from Adopted, the movie, in particular, The Multiracial Family. If you go back to this description of this section, you'll find a link. Thank you.